devices ran our lives, uh, some words that you might say to those that you love in your house at the end of the day before heading off to sleep might be, uh, good night, darling, sweet dreams, I'll see you in the morning, it'll be a wonderful new day. And now devices rule our lives, so some other phrases you might hear before going off to sleep. Can you get off your screen? Is everything on the charger? We live in an overcharged world where everything needs charging. In our house before bedtime, all computers need to be plugged in and charging, ready for the next day, as do the mobile phones, the iPad, the AirPods, the headphones, the Bluetooth speakers, the Fitbits, let alone the electronic toothbrushes and the Ryobi drill bits and batteries and anything else that needs ongoing charging in our house. The corner in our dining room where many of our devices charge overnight looks like a bowl of spaghetti has tipped over all over the floor. That picture on the screen, that looks neat compared to the charging station in the corner of our dining room. And I don't think I'm the only one. I think we all wrestle with all the devices that we have that need constant charging. And of course, it's not just our devices that need recharging. We do as people. We all know that we can personally feel tired. We can feel flat physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. And as a church, often at this time of the year, we can start to feel flat and tired. We have been running nonstop for 11 months organizing programs, walking alongside people, many of whom have gone through significant events in their life. And it can take a toll on our spiritual batteries. And to top it all off, no matter how much we have done this year, guess what? There is always more to be done. How does that now make you feel? Do you feel tired already? I do. We all often feel tired. And the point of our recharge series at this time of the year is to acknowledge the reality that we just can't keep going on in our own strength. We need to be recharged again and again. But remember, the point, the point of putting a device on the charger is not so the device can just sit back and go, oh, yes, how good is this? Just a rest for a moment. Feed me that energy. The idea is to be recharged so that you can get back out there and do the job that you were designed to do. And that's the same for us as individuals and particularly as a church. And so I thought, what better way to recharge us this season than by reminding us of our purpose as a church, but also as individual followers of Jesus. For an athlete who runs but doesn't know why they are running, they're running with no reason, aimlessly, they're likely to give up as the passion starts to wane. And I think by rediscovering our purpose as a church, we can renew our passion to keep going. And thankfully, as a Christian, we don't have to look too far to discover our purpose, our why, if you like, our mission. Our mission as followers of Jesus is expressed quite clearly in a number of passages in the New Testament. But one that is often well known and quoted is this, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Jesus' own mission that he gives his disciples. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is our why. This is the mission or the purpose that Jesus has given his disciples. And at its heart, can you see, I've highlighted it there for you, it's making disciples. Go and make disciples. But my question for us tonight is, how are disciples made? How are disciples made? Now, as a church, we have tried to summarize what the New Testament teaches about discipleship into these five steps. Reach, engage, 
nurture, equip, worship. Now, you might be familiar with those terms in terms of the way that we have structured ministry and programs uh, in our church. And that is true, but underneath all of that is a deeper vein. This renew strategy also reflects the faith journey that all disciples of Jesus are on. They are first reached out to with the good news of Jesus. And as they believe, they are engaged in a church community, they nurture and grow, they become more like Jesus. And the end of that faith journey is we, as we have just sung, on that day, will be gathered around the throne of Jesus, singing his praise for all eternity. Today, we're beginning at the first step of that discipleship pathway, reach. And what I mean by that tonight, giving expression to it as a church, is that we want to reach out to the different communities in Western Sydney and beyond, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the first step of making disciples, proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Here and like Norm and Janelle Gorey, beyond. Now, there are a number of places in the New Testament that describe what the good news is that we are to proclaim. But one in particular is that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, his purpose in writing at least this little section is to clarify the gospel or the good news. So what is it? Well, firstly, it is the gospel received. In verse 3, Paul says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Now, we haven't got into the content of the good news just yet, but this little sentence is really important. It's important because it tells us that the gospel is not something Paul has made up. It is something that he received, which he has then passed on as he received it. He didn't have to glam up the gospel so that the Corinthians would receive it. He passed it on faithfully. And we don't have to revise the gospel or glam it up for our day. Our responsibility is as we have received it, we simply pass it on. But what is it? Well, we keep reading. The gospel is this, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, the Apostle Peter, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive. Not right now, but at the time Paul wrote this, they were. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the Apostles, Last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me, says Paul. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not ineffective. I love this chapter in the New Testament, because it summarizes the gospel, yes, but it also highlights what is most important. Did you hear Paul say that? what is most important about the gospel. And the first is this, that Christ died and rose again for our sins. That is the most important thing. Christ died and rose again for our sins. There are many things that are broken in our world and need fixing. But at the heart of of it all, the Bible says, is the human heart and our sin. That attitude toward God that says, God, I don't want you to make the rules and tell me what to do. I want to make the rules and do what I want to do. I want to be in charge. I want to be God, at least over my own life. And that's a big problem. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, this is more than just overindulging in ice cream or chocolate one evening. Paul says, the wages of sin is death. That is sin pays back in death. And not just physical death, but spiritual death, coming under the just judgment of God. 
But God so loved the world that he has made a way. This is the gospel. This is the good news. He has made a way for our sins to be paid for without us having to pay them. He sent Jesus to die in our place for our sins so that we never have to. That is the good news. A number of years ago, I read a story about a young mum uh, who was getting out of her car in a rush and she had her twin babies in the back seat. And as she got out of the car, she forgot to put the handbrake on. And as she got out of the car, the car started to roll back down her driveway and she lived on a busy street where often lots of cars, even trucks, would drive past. And she could see the car rolling down the driveway into busy traffic with her babies in the back and she didn't have time to try and get back into the car and reef on the handbrake. She did what she thought she could only do. She lay down at the back of the car across the driveway so that the car rolled over the top of her to stop its momentum. She fractured her pelvis. She broke her legs. She ripped open her stomach. But she survived. But she was prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice to save her baby. Well, friends, I want to tell you that Jesus already has made the ultimate sacrifice. He did die in our place for our sins so that we might be forgiven. No more guilt. No more shame reconciled with our creator completely. Not because of anything we have done to earn it, but simply a gift of grace from Jesus our Saviour. Can you see why that is good news? It is absolutely good news. The second thing that I want you to see tonight that is of most importance with respect to the gospel is this that it happened in accordance with the Scriptures. Because did you notice Paul says in this chapter, twice something happened in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus died in accordance with the Scriptures and he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. And he includes this as what is most important. Why? What is most important about this fact? Well, there are a number of Old Testament predictions about the death and resurrection of Jesus. I can't show them all to you tonight. If you want, I'm happy to show them to you afterwards. Uh, as we continue to fellowship together. But why this is important is it means that Jesus' death and resurrection was not God's plan B for the world. It's not like humanity managed to plead with God, twist his arm and get him to do something nice for us that we don't deserve. No, it was always God's plan to save his people. It was always God's plan to send Jesus to live and die and rise again for us. It reveals his deep, faithful love for his people. When sin started to infect the world, God could have done a whole flood thing again and wiped us all out. But he didn't. He made a promise to save the world by sending his son. Jesus is not God's plan B. He is God's plan A. And the other thing that is of most importance is this, that Jesus appeared after he had risen from the dead. I've highlighted there on the screen for you, do you notice the repetition of the word appeared? Paul wants us to understand and see Jesus appeared. He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter. He appeared to the apostles. He appeared to James. He appeared... To 500 brothers at one time, he even appeared to Paul himself. What does Paul want us to see? Jesus appeared. He appeared, he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. Why is that important? Well, again, I think it's important because it reveals that the gospel is not primarily an idea or a philosophy like Buddhism. The gospel is an event that happened in history, an event that can be fact-check to determine whether it's fake news or great news, but an event nonetheless. Now, modern-day sceptics have tried to say that Jesus didn't really physically rise from the dead. 
They say Jesus spiritually rose in the hearts of his disciples as they grieved his death so much that they just imagined that he was alive. But that would have been news to all the people that are listed here in 1 Corinthians 15. It would have been news to Paul and to Peter and to James and to 12 and the 500 brothers who Paul specifically mentions, some of whom are still alive at the time he wrote this. Why does he mention that? Presumably because he says to the Corinthians, if you don't believe me that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared, there are a whole bunch of people that saw him alive. I'll give you their phone number. You can text them and they can verify what I'm saying. Because he really did rise from the dead. And it's also important that Jesus appeared to prove that he had risen. Why? So that you and I can have confidence, absolute assurance that our sins have been paid for. Later in this chapter, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. But, verse 20 Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I don't know if you've ever had to pay an invoice. Some of you are still in high school, have no idea what an invoice is. One day you will discover this. It's a bill that you have to pay. And once you've paid it, sometimes the vendor will pull out this stamp that says paid in full and stamp your bill or your invoice to assure you that it's been paid for, that there's nothing more that you have to do. I want to suggest to you that Jesus' resurrection and his appearance is like God's giant paid in full stamp that gives us absolute confidence assurance that our sins are fully paid for, that Jesus' death was completely sufficient to pay for your sin and my sin and the sin of everybody who puts their trust in him. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that Paul received, that he passed on to the Corinthians and they too received it. But the gospel received needs to be the gospel believed. The gospel received needs to be the gospel believed. And Paul says, praise be to God, that the Corinthians did believe in verse 11, that they received it and they believed. In verse 2, Paul says they took their stand on it. That is, they made the gospel the foundation of their life. They weren't going to live for comfort and for happiness and pleasure and money and wealth and other human relationships. They were standing on the gospel. They're going to live their lives to glorify Jesus. Praise be to God. But Paul also reminds them that they need to keep on believing it. He says, you are also saved by it, that is the gospel, if you hold to the message I proclaim to you unless you believed for no purpose. That is, if the Corinthians decide to turn away from Jesus, they are turning away from the only one who can save them. They are saved if they hold to the message, if they keep on believing it. And if you are someone that has received the gospel tonight, and I know that most of you have, then one of the aims that I have for this recharge season is just to keep presenting to you how good the good news is. I just want to keep presenting to you how glorious Jesus is so that you are never tempted to trade him in for something far less or give him up completely that we will continue to sing as we will sing in just a few moments, words like this. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us, that whoever believes in him will live forever. If you started to lose sight of just how good the gospel is, let me encourage you this recharge season to soak yourself in the gospel. Read it, hear it, listen to it, sing it. You know how like at the end of the day, a really hot day, you're, you're exhausted, you feel gross and dirty, you get into that beautiful shower and you just feel the water coming over your body and it's just enriching and refreshing and recharging. 
I want the good news of Jesus to be like that for you this month. The gospel received is the gospel believed. And then once the gospel is believed, the gospel ought to be proclaimed. Because my hope during this recharge season is that a recharged church will become a reach out church, proclaiming the good news of Jesus. For how can we keep it to ourselves when we know how good it is? When Ness gave birth to our three kids all those years ago, sorry, Riley, it was such good news. Riley has entered the world. Jonah has entered the world. Mimi has entered the world. I wanted to get up onto the roof of the hospital with the loudest megaphone I could. You think that little one out there that gets your attention at mid-service break is loud. I wanted to get the biggest and just tell the world, my kids are here. Come and see. How much more Jesus, the saviour of the world. But of course, there are a few obstacles, aren't there, to proclaiming that news. There is growing ignorance about Jesus in our community. I read a statistic recently that said 60% of Sydney siders, 60% of Sydney siders say that they don't even know a Christian. Can you just imagine that? 60% of greater Sydney so they don't even know a Christian. And so that means we can't simply rely on our friendship circles to make an impact with the gospel. And so it's why as a church we deliberately run some reach out ministries to try and connect with the 60% of the population we don't even have as friends. It's why we run Fresh Food Monday, English classes, playtime. It's why we've employed a chaplain at the Arista village to connect with the 60% or try and connect with the 60% that may not even know a Christian. And so tonight, this first Sunday in Recharge, focusing on reach, I just want to say a big thank you to all our volunteers who are serving in this space. Thank you. Keep on going. But I think it's fair to say that one of the biggest obstacles we have when it comes to proclaiming the gospel is ourselves and our fear. We can be afraid. Can you? I know I can. I'm sure that you can as well. We fear rejection. We fear loss. I might lose this friend. I might lose my influence in my workplace or wherever, online. I might lose my job if I start telling people about the good news of Jesus. And I don't want to dismiss those fears. They are real. I feel them. I'm sure that you do as well. And of course, Jesus said we ought to expect rejection as we proclaim the gospel. But I do think we can over-exaggerate our fear at times. Another statistic that was released recently said that two-thirds of Australians are likely to attend a church service if they are invited by a friend. Or a family member. Let me say that again. Two thirds of Aussies are likely to come to a church service if you invite them. That's good news. Sometimes we can over exaggerate the views, oh, nobody wants to come. But actually, the research says that two thirds of Aussies are likely to say yes if a friend invites them. And so let me encourage you to invest in your friendships. Make more friends if you need to. Earlier this year, I gave a workshop on personal evangelism. I gave five tips on sharing your faith. And one of those tips, the first, I called merging your universes. And what I meant by that is you have one universe, which is your Christian friends universe. But you more than likely have another universe full of your non-Christian friends, or not yet Christian friends is the way that I would prefer to talk about them. Is there a way that your Christian friends and your non-Christian friends, those two universes, can start to merge so that your non-Christian friends start to meet other Christians? And remember, 
if the obstacle in society is that 60% of Sydney siders don't even know are Christians, can you imagine if more and more in our community start to know other Christians, if we start to merge those universes, two-thirds of them are going to say yes if we invite them to church. And what happens at church? What do we proclaim each and every week? The gospel of Jesus. Now, maybe you fear of saying the wrong thing with your friend. Let our passage be an encouragement to you today. Remember what is of most importance, and it's simply this. Jesus lived, Jesus died, and he rose again for your sins. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose again for your sins. If nothing else, as you engage in a conversation with your friends, say that and share your story of how that gospel became good news to you, how it gave you a better story for your life, and share that with your friends. And who knows, under God, that might become their story as well. And remember that as we persevere in proclaiming the gospel, we have a promise from Jesus. Do you remember after the Great Commission, go and make disciples? After the Great Commission comes the promise, the great comfort. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If we were alone in our proclamation of the gospel, well, actually, we're not alone. Look around the room. There are 50, 60 people here tonight, and we can work together as a team supporting one another in our proclamation of the gospel. But even if we were alone, we wouldn't be. Because Jesus has promised to be with us always, even to the very end of the age. If he can roll a stone away from the tomb, he can soften the hardest of hearts. And so as I finish, I want you to take out this little insert in your service sheet and turn to the bit that says three, two, one, prayer. I think one point of action in response to this message tonight is this, that we can pray. Yes, I want you to proclaim, but let me urge you just tonight to start with this, to pray. I want you to write down the name of three friends that you have that don't yet know Jesus. And I want to exhort you to commit to praying for them twice a week. I don't think that's too much of a burden. Three friends, twice a week, for this whole month of recharge. Do you think you can do that? Now, just imagine if we all did that. Every one of us here at night church, every one of us at morning church, committed to praying for three, not yet Christians, twice a week, for a whole month. Could you just imagine what God might do? Remember, he is faithful. He is with us. I think our opportunities to engage with our non-Christian friends, to share our story, and to share the good news of Jesus, will just multiply. And even if only two-thirds of all of our friends say yes to an invite, we would fill this building. Can you see it? Maybe I can never see that. The gospel is good news, friends. Everybody in our community or many people in our community are looking for something to give them satisfaction in life and they're looking in all the wrong places. And you have the best news ever. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way that you have reached out to us in your Son, Jesus, that he has lived, that he has died, that he has risen again for our sins so we could be forgiven, so that we could be adopted into your family. What good news. Help us to pass faithfully on to others that gospel which we have received and believed so that others too might sing with us. For God so loved the world 
that he gave us his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will live forever.